This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. A Rome of one's own, the forgotten women of the Roman Empire. I welcome Emma Southern, the author of a, an extremely witty and careful explication of what I've never read, the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic, the Roman monarchy, from the point of view of the women who lived and died in it. This book presents a completely new version of everything you've assumed about where did Julius Caesar come from? Or what, what was the decline and fall of the Roman Empire? Or why did it divide into Constantinople and allow Rome to attenuate so that there were less than 10,000 people there at one point around 1,000 years ago? Emma, congratulations and a very good evening to you. We begin in the monarchy, the kingdom, somewhere in the mid eighth century BCE, ending somewhere in the sixth century BCE, as told by the historian Livy, chiefly, there are other voices, but Livy is a, a major driver here. When did Livy write this and who was the audience Livy had in mind? Good evening to you, Emma. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Livy is writing a very long time after the period that he's writing about. He's writing in the first century, CE. So he's writing in the uh, in the reign of the first emperor Augustus, um, and he is writing for an audience of people who are being forced to come to terms with um, the return to monarchy, essentially to the having one man who is in charge of everything um, and who is reshaping the Roman Empire around himself. Um, and Livy is part of a large. A cultural project essentially to write Roman history so that it leads to Augustus and so that it explains Augustus's uh, prominence and his reign. Um, the other big writer from that period is Virgil um, and his Aeneid, um, which tells a very similar story. Uh, and Dionysus of Halicarnassus, who is also writing at, at the same time. Um, and they are all writing in the same. 50 year period for the same audience of people um, who are having to relearn their history um, because it now needs to explain Augustus's rise um, and the uh, the new republic as they were coming to see it, which we, we now know as the empire. What we would call in America, Roman exceptionalism. Why Very we, much so. Why we're the victors. And they're yes. writing for Augustus, whom you now and again, also known as Octavian, you now and again emphasize was very keen on how people remembered him, how he presented yes. himself at the time and how he was remembered. So Livy means to flash, uh, f flatter, Dionysius Heliconarsus means to flatter. They all mean to flatter the emperor. They do all mean to flatter him. They all mean to uh, help his project. Um, and they all mean to uh yeah explain why rome has got to this point where it is so incredibly powerful and where it has defeated um pretty much everybody now that egypt um it's written they're written just after uh, the uh, defeat of antony and cleopatra and the absorption of egypt into the empire and that is um really takes Roman power to an enormous extent. And so the other part of this project is to explain that Rome is the most virtuous and the most beloved by the gods um, of all the people who have ever lived on the earth. So now that we've characterized what you're about to hear, remember this has a purpose. It's not just once upon a time. Persilia, married to Romulus, who is a real person to Livy and a real person to Augustus. Romulus yeah. founds Rome, uh, and four years later, he wants the Roman success to grow, but they need women because they're just a bunch of men standing around yelling at each other. <laughs> and now we introduce the Sabines. Who were they, and who were the Sabine women? So the Sabines are um, people who are from the area of, of kind of Tuscany. So they're from around um, other areas in Italy. They're Etruscan um, and they are another peoples um, who exist in the same world that early Rome does. So Rome is founded as a city state within a lot of other Etruscan city states in Italy. Um, 
And initially, Romulus tried to get women by sending out envoys and asking uh, all of these city-states around Rome for permission to marry their daughters. Um, but he had largely populated his city by offering sanctuary and asylum to um, people like uh, enslaved people who had run away from enslavement or criminals who were running away from um, prosecution in their hometown and people, anybody who wanted to come would receive asylum there. Uh, and unsurprisingly, the people, the Sabine people and others did not want to marry their daughters off to the new, these new Romans. Um, so he developed instead a plan to uh, forcibly take himself some women um, and he and his men um, put on a new religious festival. They claimed to have found a lost altar um, and they uh, put on a new religious festival um, in, in honour of this god that they had found and invited people, prominent people from nearby towns, including the Sabines, to come and celebrate this new festival with them, um, which they did, uh, and hundreds came. Uh, and in the middle of the games that they held in celebration, because religious uh, Roman uh, Roman religious observation very often involved games and, uh, and races and uh, performances, they gave a signal, um, stood up, and uh, took the women, the young women, the daughters of the Sabines, um, took them at knife point and carried them back to their houses uh, as their wives. Pulling their hair. Yes, of course. Yes. And, and in imagery, you, you see them when they've described this, they're, you know, they've got women under their arms, they've got women over their shoulders. There's very much a forcible taking of women. Did Hercilia approve of this? Uh, Hercilia, there are two versions of Hercilia. In one, she is um, a young woman who is taken. She's one of the women who is kidnapped. Um, and in another version, she is an older woman who is the mother um, of one of the, the Sabine women um, who stays with her daughter. Um, so all of the men run away uh, and she is the one who stays. But in all versions, she is one of the women who is um, who is held captive. So she is not one who approves, but one who is is forcibly held in Rome. I remember now, Augustus believed this. Time passes and the Sabines men finally gather their courage to come back and rescue their wives and daughters yeah. And they meet in a contest below the Palatine Hill and the battle goes on until the at the final ap moment before everybody's going to slaughter everybody else, the women come back and what do they want? They come running down the hill. This is the final battle. Uh, the Sabines have actually uh, defeated the Romans um, and managed to get inside the city walls, which is a big uh, kind of humiliation for the Romans. Um, but as they're about to start the final battle in the center of Rome, um, the women all come running down the hill, led by uh, Hercilia. Um, it's been long enough that these women have managed to conceive and sometimes have children. Um, and Acilia gives a long speech in which she implores both sides um, to put down their weapons because they have turned this war by marrying with these women by having children with them they have turned this war not into a war between enemy forces but a war between families because the women stand between the same by fathers um and the roman sons-in-laws um and now these women have the grandchildren of the sabine men um and who are the children of the roman men and um the the broader point that is being made is that women hold men together um, and that marriage and family are something that um that hold men in concord with one another and that they owe each other obligations to not harm one another once they have become son-in-law and father-in-law um father and son uh brother-in-law and that the women are the glue who hold men together and stop them from fighting um, Emma makes the point that the Sabines had defeated the Romans before this final battle. The reason is because a woman named Tarpia, a young woman, 
opened the gates in exchange for what she thought would be gold ringlets, but it was not. The Sabines fooled her. And so what we have here is Tarpeia betraying Rome and yes. Arcilia saving Rome by saying, by the way, you're all relatives. So if you're going to kill each other, kill us first because you'll make us widows and orphans. So yeah. two women, Tarpeia, the betrayer, and Hercilia, the wise voice, they are the foundation for Rome right there. They are. They are. And it, in that you also get a thing that you will find in a lot of Roman literature and, and uh, a lot of Roman versions of their own history and then a lot of Western literature, which is the the bad woman who is saved by the good woman. Um and the how the um the the sins of the bad woman in that Tarpeia opens the gate because she is enticed by luxury, which is a thing that the Romans thought was a profoundly female thing. Um, is um, is redeemed by the woman who does who puts her family first. We need to pursue this good and bad woman story. I'm with Emma Southern. A Rome of One's Own is the book, The Forgotten Women of the Roman Empire. This is the Roman Empire from the woman's point of view as much as possible. We go immediately to, we'll go quickly through the story of a couple of Etruscan kids. Some uh, Luca, Luc, Lucamo, who is a Corinthian, is a Greek, but he marries yeah. an Etruscan young woman named Tanakio, and they pick up stakes and go to the new Rome. And through an amazing series of coincidences, they become the king and queen of Rome. I'm going fast through their story, not only because it's fantastic, but because I want to get to Lucretia and Tullia. <laughs> Uh, because I'm looking for this dyad that sustains the Roman telling, recalling always that this is, pleases Augustus. So we're not getting a story here as we understand history. We're getting a story here that pleases the boss. Yeah. Uh, Tanakil and, well, Tarakin, Tar Tarquinius, he takes on the name of an Etruscan city to make himself king. Uh, Tarquinius and Tanakil produce heirs, and those heirs become the kingship between the 8th century and the 6th century. And in the telling, it's important to come across a woman named Lucretia, because Emma assures me, you can <laughs> move all the women in these stories except for Lucretia, and you're okay, but if you, move, if you remove Lucretia, you've lost Rome. Yes. Lucretia is a good woman at home spinning wool for a toga. And she her is. husband and his friends are out battling somewhere. And one night they're drinking and they propose to each other, what is their test? Their test, they get into a bet or a drinking game about who has the best wife. Um, and uh, the test is what their wives are doing when their husbands are away. Um, and the idea is that if their wives are being good then um, and are being faithful, then they're good wives. And if they're not, then they are bad wives. And they sneak back to Rome. It is uh, Lucretia's husband and his cousins, one of whom is the son of the king. Um, they sneak back to Rome and peep in the windows of their houses to see what their wives are up to. Um, and uh, the the king's sons, uh, daughter, their wives are uh, having a party and they're drinking wine and they are laughing um, and having a good time while their husbands are away. Drinking wine um, was considered to be much like having gold to be a sign of, of profound female decadence. But when they get to uh, Lucretia's house, um, they open the door uh, and look in and see that she is sitting in the atrium as the sun is going down. And she is sitting only with um, members of her own household who are all women. Uh, and she is in one telling weaving a, a toga for her husband and crying uh, because she misses him so much. Um, 
And that is ideologically weaving is the opposite of drinking wine. One is decadence and the other one is uh, is pure virtue um, because it's hard and quite horrible. Um, but a, a, an elite woman doing it um, is, is considered to be profoundly virtuous. And so uh, uh, Lucretia wins the best wife competition uh, and everybody is, is very impressed by how glorious she is. She's so virtuous that Sextus, the, the son of the king, returns in another night and ravishes Lucretia. And yes. she she calls her husband and her father and their good friend Brutus to confess to them that she's had her honor compromised. What do they what do they say to her, Emma? Uh they say to her that um, you know, they're they in a profoundly human way, they say this is awful, um, but it's not your fault, and um, we will do what we can with this. Um, they're very upset. She's very upset. Um, she is uh, coerced into uh, the in into having sex with Sextus because um, he threatens to kill her and kill a man and put them in bed together and um, tell everybody that she was committing adultery if she doesn't. Um, and she is very, very worried about her honour um, and her reputation. Uh, and so she, while her family are crying, she takes out a blade um, and says that she will not allow any unvirtuous woman to live using Lucretia as an excuse um, and kills herself in front of her family. Uh, this is important as a foundation myth. Remember, yes. Augustus is listening to this and Augustus turns this story and all and the word virtue into a mandate for the Roman Empire. And yes. Emma's telling us we will see that play itself out again and again. We need to see the other side of the coin, however. So when we come back, we're going to introduce Tulia, who is the opposite of Lucretia <laughs> and will lead to the end of the Roman monarchy and the beginning of the Republic. The book yes. is A Rome of One's Own, The Forgotten Women of the Roman Empire. Emma Southern is the author. Highly recommended. Making the Romans as fresh as the 21st century in their ambitions and their retelling of the details. And we now introduce the other side of the coin from Lucretia, the virtuous one, who was celebrated by Augustus and his first century AD and passed on to the Julian Claudian family as the paragon of how a woman should behave. Tullia is the other thing. She is the granddaughter of Tanakil, that young woman who with her husband traveled from the Etruscan city of Tarquinia to Rome as the foundation of the monarchy. But now Tanakil, uh, Atulia, is more ambitious than her grandmother, although, you know, the acorn doesn't fall very far, etc. And she's married to the wrong man. Emma, this story is extremely believable because <laughs> Tulia's wickedness do we know what drives Tulia? Did she inherit? Did the Romans hear this as just inheritance or something? They hear this as um, a kind of uh, almost to them cliched story of of um, of female ambition um, and uh, how women have uh, can go wrong in a very specific way because uh, Tulia has a sister who's also called Tulia, and they're both married off to their cousins. Um, each one is uh, married to uh, a man. They're basically married in basis of age. So the oldest, Tullia, is married to the oldest brother and the youngest, Tullia, is married to the younger brother. Um, and they turn out to have um, fundamentally opposed personalities. Um, so our Tullia is very, very ambitious. Um, she very badly wants a public life where people see her as a queen and um and treat her as a queen um she wants to be in charge and she wants to be worshipped um and the fact that she is married to a man who doesn't want those things he doesn't want to be king um he doesn't want to try to overthrow his own father um 
he he just wants to live a, a, a gentle life. But on the other hand, her brother-in-law very much badly does want to be king. He wants um, everything that comes with being king. The um, He wants the facies and he wants the crown and he wants a big throne. Um, she starts an affair, therefore, with her brother-in-law, uh, which results eventually um, in... Uh, them both killing their own partners. Uh, so she kills her husband, her brother-in-law kills uh, his wife, her sister, um, and then they sneak off and secretly get married um, and start a uh, a revolution um, and she overthrows her own father. After murdering her sister and her brother-in-law, she overthrows her own father and that is um, how she comes to the throne uh, and how... Uh, Lucius Tarquinius becomes the king and it is their son, Sextus, um, who assaults Lucretia. So what we're looking at is the foundation myth told from Lucretia's point of view and Tullius' point of view, remembering that Livy is doing this. Ovid gets involved here as well in telling the story in which the ending will be the success of the Romans to extricate themselves from wickedness. And they will do that by running... a revolution is that what they think of it did they think of it it's yeah straight- so this is considered to be um the this first overthrowing of of servius is considered to be a um a coup uh a, an illegitimate overthrowing of people who want power for the sake of power um and proof that monarchy is bad because um it breeds these people when sextus then um rapes lucretia um this is the sign that the monarchy has become a tyranny um and that now no one is safe um from the arrogance and ambition and entitlement really of the royal family um and so but he is terrible because his parents are terrible because his mother is ambitious um and she um commits several uh all religious crimes to a certain extent, crimes of a total failure of duty um, and uh, a polluting crime. She runs over her father's body. um, She disobeys her father in several ways. She kills him um, and then she defiles his body. And that is the the crime really that is committed that is then um, reproduced in... um, Sextus's assault of Lucretia and then Lucretia's great virtue um, cleanses what Tullia has done and kickstarts the revolution that overthrows the monarchy because Brutus takes her body, shows it as a violated body um, to the Romans and they rise up and overthrow the kings and institute the glorious republic which the Romans consider to be their the, their greatest achievement and the most perfect form of government. And 2,000 years later, we have the same Senate here in the U.S. and the Parliament in the United Kingdom. And yep. what we have here is, again, telling Augustus it's okay to be the boss as long as you don't call yourself a king. And, Def- Augustus, yeah. and that, all of a sudden, Emma, I figured out what Princeps is all about. He wanted to yes. avoid being regarded as um, a, a hand tool of of Tom Keel. He didn't yes. he didn't want to have a queen. He didn't want to be somebody who was going to lead a revolt. It and Livy and Ovid is they both understand that when they're writing and and Hella, and um Dionysius he also understands that that must be the way we end this story. Yes, we understand that with, we end the, always end this story with the restored republic. Uh, the republic is glorious. And Augustus says of himself, he wrote his own autobiography for, um, called the Res Gestae. And he's, he says, and everybody says about him, he restored the republic and saved it from tyranny. Um, and he has put everything back together and the republic is perfect again. Um, and it, they completely allied the fact that he is essentially a, in all but name a king um but the the glorification of the republic but the republic centered around a single man so brutus then becomes the first consul um he then has a lot of power that he uses um and it is it is a a republic that is centered around a single family um but it is nonetheless a restored republic brutus was a friend of lucretia's husband yes. and he played 
a simple man most of his life until the moment he took charge of avenging Lucretia and establishing the Republic, the hundred senators, the hundred best men. We come now to the religion that sustains all this, that pulls it together, Opia. Opia, yeah. the Vestal Virgin. This is the fifth century BCE. Uh, where did the Vestals come from? Is that Etruscan? The Vestals are Etruscan. They're very, very ancient, even by the time that the Romans come around. Um, they are something that exists in, um, in as far as we can tell, all Etruscan cities. Um, and we don't really know what the origin of them is, but we they are focused on this incredibly ancient idea of an eternal flame, um, which is a representation of Vesta, who is one of the big 12 goddesses um, the, um, in the Greek Olympian pantheon, which is, I think, more familiar to people. She's Hestia. Um, and in the Roman pantheon, she is Vesta. And she is um, a goddess who embodies the concept of home and the concept of safety. Um, and Vestal virgins in Rome, they have six at all times, whose job it is primarily to tend that eternal flame in the center of Rome, to keep it pure um, and to keep themselves pure uh, in order to keep that flame protecting Rome. And then Opia falls. Uh, yes. And she, she is no longer chaste and she must be punished. And the way they do it is especially grotesque because it integrates the sin, I, the violation of Vestal with the wall of the city. How do they kill her? Uh, so they effectively sacrifice her to the gods, but without actually sacrificing her. Um, it's necessary, the way they find out that a Vestal virgin has, um, has lost her virginity and stopped being a virgin is generally that something terrible will happen and there will be signs and omens from the gods um, and they need to placate the gods. So they make what is effectively a human sacrifice, um, but without having to get their own hands dirty because they don't technically like human sacrifice. Um, so they hold a funeral for her where they parade her through the city as though she is already a body. And then they um, take her to a cave that has been dug out uh, um, just inside the walls of Rome. Um, and they wall her inside that hole in the ground with um, some milk, some bread uh, and an oil lamp. Um, and they leave her in there to either suffocate or starve to death, um, which is a very slow um, and and very horrible way to kill somebody. Uh, note here, there's no reason to believe that Opia did anything wrong. No, uh, because the only evidence, yeah, the only evidence that she did anything wrong really is that um, someone some things start happening around Rome. They're having, they've got a, a um, they've lost some battles. There's been a revolt. Then they start getting omens um, around Roman territory. You get things like animals talking um, and uh, things, strange things falling from the sky or um, uh, strange sights and visions that you see or unusual births are a very common one as well. Um, and then they will hold an investigation to find out what has caused these and which God is upset. And what it comes down to is that the um, very often that a Vestal Virgin has done something wrong. Um, but they're never, we tend to read it that the Vestal Virgin has consensually done something wrong um, and has had sex because they are um, given over to, they're consecrated to this life of, of being a, professional priestess uh, at between the ages of six and 10. So they're very young. It's not something that they choose really, their parents choose it for them. Um, and so it's often assumed that this is consensual, but there's no actual uh, evidence of that. And we're never very clear what it is that actually happened to them um, or if they did anything at all. Uh, later examples of women who are um, uh, either tried or tried and found guilty are found are being tried for things like wearing dresses that are too nice um, or telling too many jokes, which is considered to be um, unchaste behavior. And so there's no actual evidence that that Opia ever did anything, um, just that enough people thought she did. 
We must introduce Cicero's opinion of women. <laughs> back. A Rome of one's own, the forgotten women of the Roman Empire. We're in the Republic right now, right at the end of the Republic. Uh, Caesar's alive when we come back, and so is Cicero, and so is a very rich woman named Clodia. Emma Southern, the forgotten women of the Roman Empire, a Rome of one's own. Just when you thought Rome was 2,000 years ago, here comes Claudia and Cicero. Cicero is a talker. He is, <laughs> he is a gifted man from outside of Rome. He's a climber. He is not one of the hundred families or however the many there are now claiming to be patricians, the founders of Rome. And yet he has a golden tongue. He also has enemies. And one of them is Claudia's brother. Emma, this is the best version of Cicero I've ever encountered. <laughs> I've always seen him as a victim of the ambitions of men such as Caesar. Yeah. And Catiline and all of the, the pretenders who wanted to be the boss, the king, the leader. But his dispute with Claudia's brother, what is it based on? Why does he fall out with that family? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are friends to begin with, um, but they fall out because um, Clodius uh, commits a crime where he breaks into uh, Julius Caesar's house um, while his wife is holding a religious festival just as a woman. Um, his defense when he is caught doing this is that he can't possibly have done it because he was out of the country at the time. He was not in Rome. Um, and Cicero comes forward and says, yes, you were in Rome because I saw you on that day. Um, and this starts a feud between the two of them. Um, eventually, in order to get revenge, Clodius um, has himself... Uh, he, he changes his name to Clodius, has himself adopted by a plebeian family so he can take a position that he's not really al allowed to have within the uh, the government and passes a law which is specifically aimed at Cicero, um, which makes it illegal to execute people without a trial uh, for a consul to do that, which is something that Cicero had done during his consulship to Catiline um, and then has... Cicero exiled under this law retroactively and then burns his house down. <laughs> and so Claudius' his sister is Claudia. These names yes. run together. There were three daughters named Claudia. And we have to we have to remind ourselves we're doing a little guessing here that we know the right Claudia. C -O -E -I -A. Yeah. Oh. However, Cicero, to get back at Claudius, decides to take it out on Claudia. Why does he do that? Uh, she is just a convenient, um, he'll take it out on Clodius whenever he can. When he's allowed back into Rome, um, he gets back into his job of prosecuting crimes. Um, and he's just given the opportunity, um, a golden opportunity for him, which is that Clodia, um, it's a terrible time in Roman politics. And uh, Clodia is involved in an assassination attempt against an um, Egyptian diplomat um, with a young man who is a friend of Cicero's called Caelius. Um, he then, Caelius then tries to murder Clodia um, and Clodia takes him to court for attempted murder. But Caelius gets Cicero as his defense counsel um, and Cicero puts together a spectacular uh, speech known as the Pro-Caelius where he... Um, absolutely assassinates Claudia's character. Um, he accuses her of everything from um, being a working prostitute to um, luring boys into her house in order to um, destroy their reputation, uh, to being a murderer herself. Um, and he says that she is a um, accusing Caelius of trying to kill her because she tried to seduce him and he said no and so she is um, trying to to have him exiled in revenge and she he calls her the Palatine Medea um, as someone who will burn the whole world down in order to get revenge against someone who has spurned her and it's a 90 minute speech but he, every time he speaks to the Senate he he goes out of his way to defame her what does she can she defend herself how does she defend she herself she can't defend herself. She, as a woman, is not allowed to speak in court. Um, she will have a, a 
prosecution counsel, but we don't have um, whatever he said uh, to um, to defend it. But um, Cicero is remembered as one of the great uh, great speakers of his time for a reason, and it's because he can put together a, an argument that is feels very specific but is almost impossible to defend against he um, makes few very specific claims but a lot of insinuations um and we do not know how she was able or if she was able to defend herself but we know that she lost the case yes remember calling somebody medea of the palatine medea not only killed her her children to get back at her husband who'd been who'd wandered off with another woman she killed yeah. jason as well uh, she might have killed all the Argonauts. I don't know. She just kept killing. <laughs> Call, calling she kills her. his wife. Yeah, she kills his new wife, and then she kills her children, and then she rides off into the sun uh, because she is uh, the granddaughter of the sun. So Medea of the Palatine is a is defamation in Rome of this time. But Caesar's coming, and the revolution uh, that was from the monarchy to the republic is about to be a revolution from the republic to the empire. So we need to turn to women of the empire next. The book is A Rome of One's Own, The Forgotten Women of the Roman Empire. I'm going to miss Cicero. He's a, <laughs> a wonderful character. Uh, he and, is. And in telling his story to Augustus, I can imagine that Augustus was pleased. Who, just uh, We have 30 seconds. Who was the major source on Cicero? Cicero himself or did somebody Cicero write? himself, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why we have him such heroic speeches. That explains. Yeah. Or as you say, he edits himself before he passes it on to history. Oh, yeah. Emma Southern's the author, A Rome of One's Own. It is now the Roman Empire. The monarchy is gone. The memory of the monarchy pleases Augustus, the emperor. The republic is gone. The memory of the republic came to this moment when Augustus will present himself as a man who saves the republic by making himself the first among equals, the princeps. He has a daughter, however, and herein lies a tale. Emma, this is Julia Caesar Phileas, who becomes when she's 11 years old, born 39 BCE, comes when she's 11 years old, Julia Augusti Philia. Augustus wanted sons. He wanted heirs. He has a daughter who has a mind of her own. She's very well educated. And then she's married to Marcellus at 13 years old. Why? Marcellus was her cousin. What was Augustus thinking? He was trying to make a son-in-law. So um, this is where we go back to that. those stories of the Sabine women. Uh, the closest thing there is to a son is a son-in-law. Um, and he wanted Marcellus to be his heir. Um, he's the daughter of his sister Octavia, the daughter, he's the son of his sister Octavia. And um, he he wanted to make him his heir by making him his son-in-law, um, the closest thing he could to his son. So uh, what he uses Julia for is to marry her to the people that he uh, wants to be his proxy sons. In other words, Livy and Hel uh, and. Dionysius and all the historians have delivered this Augustus that who isn't real. The real Augustus doesn't have blood. He has cold water for veins. Yeah. And uh, Julia's mother, he gets rid of on her birthbed. Yeah. And uh, everything about him is arranging this world as it never was. And so yeah. he... He becomes inadvertently, from my reading of your book, Emma, he becomes inadvertently the creator and the bane of Rome because he's yeah. he creates a new Rome. Um, he makes Rome into what it is when we imagine Rome. He says himself he found Rome a city of brick and left it a city of marble. And he almost all of the literature that we think of when we think of Rome, um, Virgil, Livy, uh, is is Augustine, uh, Horace, Catullus, Ovid, all of it. Um, uh, he creates a lot of what we now think of as Roman law, um, and he creates the idea of the Roman family um, by going back and writing Roman history to, to fit his idea of the family. Um, and this idea of the daughter as a, a, a conduit is is one of his. He's got one weakness, one weakness. Yep. The weakness is Julia. So we're about to tell her story. Julia <laughs> Marcellus 
because Augustus wants a son-in-law, but Marcellus doesn't obey Augustus and he goes and dies on him. He and, does. <laughs> and so, so now he's got an unmarried Julia again. At this point, Julia is obedient, is uh, thankful, is uh, nobody asks, uh, uh, her father doesn't ask her what she thinks. He just, or he just gives orders. He does. He never asks anybody what they think, uh, except his own wife. Um, he asks Livia, but otherwise he never asks anybody. He just tells. All right. So now his idea is, since I don't have a son-in-law, I'll make one up by having, is this when Julia married Tiberius? This is when Julia married Agrippa. Um, so he then marries oh, Agrippa, Agrippa first. Agrippa first right. Yeah. Uh, so Agrippa is his best friend, um, his right-hand man. They went to school together. They're the same age. Um, and he makes Agrippa his heir um, by marrying uh, Julia to him. Um, and from that, they produce five children, which is a very successful marriage. And um, they get along. You observe that they get along, even though this they is They do seem to marriage. get along. Yeah, the letters um, and the... the um, they travel together a lot, which is always a sign that they like each other because there's no reason for Julia to travel with her husband when he goes to the east, when he goes um, off fighting on campaigns. Um, they, she can choose to stay at home, but she always chooses to travel with him, which is um, often a sign that they actually like each other. And Julia becomes our Lucretia here. She she pre presents herself weaving the, uh, the togas. She has five yes. children, a boy, 21 BCE, uh, named Gaius, a girl, Julia, 19 BCE, a boy, Marcus, 17 BCE. Emma's reporting is very accurate here. A girl, 15 <laughs> BCE, and a boy, Lucius, 12 BCE. But these are the days when children are not really healthy until they get past a certain age. So many of those children will have 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 doubts about them, whether they're going to live long enough. But Augustus is so eager for children. Which two does he pick off for himself? He takes the two oldest boys, so Gaius and Lucius, um, he adopts uh, as his own children, making Julia both their mother and their sister. Um, and he adopts them as, uh, the, as his official heirs um, and makes them the princes of Rome. Yes, and Agrippa... Remember, Agrippa and Julia get along. Agrippa dies 12 BCE, and Augustus lives forever. And <laughs> so he's going to live to 14 CE, and another many years. So he's now treated Julia as a marrying tool, and she's produced the heirs he wants, and he doesn't exactly throw her away. You say, that, is this when he keeps her in a cage, or has he always kept her in a cage? He's always kept her in a cage because she has never been able to do anything up until this point for herself. Um, and this is where he makes his his very big mistake, I think, which is that he has his heirs are still too young. He adopted them as babies and they're the oldest one is only six when Agrippa dies. Um, he still needs a son in law to be um, a, a real heir if he dies in the next couple of years. And so he forces Julia to marry his stepson, Tiberius, um, and they absolutely despise one another. Yes, you have a scene where <laughs> Tiberius is at a party and he sees his ex-wife who was taken from him and he yeah. starts crying. Who tells us that story? Uh, that story comes from Suetonius, um, that he is, um, and it is a very sad story. So he's forced to divorce um, his first wife, who he loves very much, who is actually also Agrippa's daughter, um, because it's quite incestuous, this family. And um, he's forced to divorce her, and he uh, cries when he sees her at a party, and then um, he spends the entire party following her around like a kind of lovesick puppy. Um, and so arrangements are made that she will never be allowed to attend a party that he is at ever again. Now, remember, Tiberius is not a man who's completely independent of blame, but at the same time, his mother, Livia. Now, Livia is a decision maker for Tiberius. Do we know? Because I was looking forward to comments, your comments about Livia. <laughs> yes, she is um, certainly um, a very powerful voice in his 
nobody tells Augustus what to do, but she can very much make her opinion heard. And he respects her opinion more than anything. Um, he understands that um, that she very much has his interests at heart as much as her own. She's made out in the ancient sources, or in Tacitus specifically, um, to be very wicked. But um, most ancient sources see her as a, a strong advisor more than anything. Um, but uh, it is she is the mother of Tiberius. Um, Augustus has to adopt Tiberius and has to take him as his son-in-law because he has... The kind of punishment for the gods, I suppose, for all of his successes is that every single male member of his family dies very, very young, um, and Tiberius becomes essentially the last one left. Now, what Julia does about it is that she proceeds to seduce everybody she can find in the Senate and yeah. everybody she can <laughs> find in the street, and not only seduce them, but seduce them in places such as the Forum, things that really matter to Augustus. So what he's achieved by having history written for his own purposes to insist that marriage is the most the most venerated part of the Roman Empire. There'll be no more stabbing me in the back. You get to deal with your wife or your husband. <laughs> yep. He's a daughter who's out of control. And yes. he tries to control her. How does he do that? Uh, he has her exiled. He is furious, um, absolutely furious, and never, ever forgives her for the rest of his life. Um, but when it um, all of her affairs are revealed because she starts making them very, very public, um, and uh, one of the people that she is having an affair with is uh, Mark Antony's oldest son, um, who uh, Augustus had left alive after he won the war. Um, so she is choosing her partners to hurt her father. Uh, he he has her exiled first to an island where she has to live by herself and no men are allowed to go there at all um, unless they are very, very ugly, um, which is specified. Uh, and then eventually the most he will relent is he will let her live on mainland Italy. But um, he keeps her in a very tightly controlled exile for um, almost 20 years. So the one person who can get back at Augustus does. He's, he's constructed a fiction, and out of that fiction comes his daughter. He dies in 14 common era, 14 CE. Tiberius and Livia then become the rulers of the empire. And what do they do about Julia? Uh, Tiberius um, cuts her off. He starves her to death. Um, he... He, he has a thing for starving people to death. He does it to a few people, but he um, uh, he absolutely hates her. Um, he hates her from the moment he is made to marry her, and he didn't like her very much before that when she was his sister. Um, and so when he is given control of her, he, um, he cuts off any food going to her, he imprisons her in her house, um, and starves her to death. The book is A Rome of One's Own, The Forgotten Women of the Roman Empire. We've spent time with Julia getting even with Augustus, but now the empire in the first AD is the product of Augustus's strong-mindedness. I'll be fair-minded here. <laughs> he's succeeded by Tiberius and Claudius, and we all know Caligula, and then Nero, and then Nero commits suicide in a strange fashion. And it, it passes on to the Flavians, and what we're looking at here is that first century, not in Rome, not even on the continent, but in Britain. Roman Britain was about as far as you could get from the center. And yet there was success. Claudius conquers it. There are cities built up. Londinium is the one we know as London, Colchester and others. But there are Roman tribes that the English students I've met are very proud of. And there are two in particular, the Brigantes and the Isonai. The Isonai are close into London. The Brigantes are in the north. I don't know my geography that well, but I do know that the Brigantes are major importance. And they're led by Cartamandua, whom you've not heard of. You've heard of the other one, Boudica. So let us start with the Cart Cartamandia, because she understands as a queen of the Brigantes that the Romans are not to be defeated, they're to be pleased. And is that an, a popular opinion when she picks it up? Is she alone of all the tribe's leaders? Is she the one who understands that you can deal with the Romans, you don't have to fight them? 
She is certainly one of the, uh, I think it's probably a majority opinion, um, once the uh, the Roman kind of initial war of conquest um, is, is pretty short, uh, and then 11 kings and queens um, submit to Claudius uh, when he has invaded in 43, uh, and she is probably one of those, um, or her predecessor is, and a lot uh, of the the rulers of Roman of kind of pre-Roman Britain will agree, including um, Boudicca's predecessors. So Prasutagius, her husband, and her, her what is either his father or her father, I do originally work with the Romans um, because the Romans do appear as a as an overwhelming force, um, in particularly in kind of southeast England, which is where. Uh, Boudicca is and northern England initially they are they're quite keen on working with the Romans because the Romans bring with them some quite nice things as well they bring wine and gold and um and fish sauce and fancy olives and things that are nicer than what you get in Britain um, <laughs> and peppercorn peppercorn exactly and yeah. spices never had those uh, <laughs> and so uh, working with the Romans is is not an unpopular initially um, but it turns out that the Romans don't often want to actually work with the uh, kind of native inhabitants of Britain. Like many empires, they just want to uh, roll over them. Um, and uh, uh, Boudicca is one of the, uh, the ones that they roll over, but Cartamandra is one who manages to work with them successfully for a very long time. Uh, now, the stories are now being told by Tacitus, who is a moralizer. And he has yes. an ambition too. He's not writing for Augustus, he's writing for Tacitus. These are the, uh, and the story of Boudicca and Cartamandua. You mentioned that Cartamandua is mentioned three times and Boudicca, yes. is that correct? That's right. So he meant he, Cartamandua comes up because she's around for much longer. Boudicca has like a two year period where she is doing anything. Um, and so there's a brief overview of her rebellion, but Cartamandua rules for, uh, about at least two decades, um, if not longer, and so um, she and wind up is... in Rome at a at a, at dinner yeah. party with her enemies. Wonderful. However, yeah. we need to remind everybody that the English and, to my knowledge, the English schools emphasize Boudicca. You have images of her everywhere. What is she yeah. to English children? What do they learn about her? She is a re kind of a representation of British exceptionalism um, and of this idea of, of British um, resistance to continental tyranny, uh, which, and then later she becomes a representation of the British Empire, which is a, a, a strange reversal of what she was actually up to. Um, but she's taught about um, Brit she's taught to us in in britain in school as a a kind of um how britain wouldn't take tyranny lying down we stood up against the evil romans and fought them hard until the final battle at watling street which we don't know where it is right now no we don't no idea and boudicca dies by her own hand, which is which is the Tacitus version by poison. Tacitus says that she dies uh, by her own hand by poison, which is his way of saying that she is. Um, he likes Boudicca. He thinks that she is strong and good, um, and so saying that she took her own life is for him a way of showing that she is unafraid of death and she embodies kind of stoic principles um, of of uh, honor in the face of defeat. Uh, and that's important for the Romans and will be an important distinction between the Romans and the Christians who are coming up. But right now we must turn from Boudicca and Cartamandua. We must turn to non-leaders, non-royals in the Roman telling. A Rome of one's own, the forgotten women of the Roman Empire, Emma Southern is the author, the women who were not royal, who were not part of the coups and backstabbings and famous ambitious tellings of histories to please Augustus, or in Tacitus' case, uh, to please himself. We go now to Julia Felix, whom we know of because of Vesuvius. Remember the ash rained down on Pompeii and Herculaneum. And the excavations since the 18th century are telling a story that nowhere else is written, the lives of ordinary Romans and the, the spectacular Julia Felix, sometime around 60 
CE, 62 CE, she has a better idea to build an establishment on her own, owning an on her own. And that what's striking here is that women in the Roman telling do not have the power of owning things. They must own it through their fathers or brothers or husbands. But Julia Felix, who might even be illegitimate, is a powerful imagination. And if you see the pictures of her place that has been excavated, it's vast, it's attractive, it'd work today. Emma, it's impossible not to love Julia Felix and her fate may be with Vesuvius, but what have we learned so far about how she conducted herself? Was this commonplace for women or is Julia Felix standing all by herself as a woman of property? Uh, I think it's more commonplace than the written sources would ha allow you to believe. When you look at archaeology, you find women um, running all kinds of businesses and being involved in, in life in their own right, um, in public life in their own right, all over. Um, and Pompeii is one of these places where we can see what kind of small businesses looked like. Um, Julia Felix runs this entertainment complex basically it has a baths um that people can visit which she, she says are um fitted for the well to do uh, so they're kind of bougie baths and then she has a a hot food restaurant um she has gardens she has shops and apartments for rent as well and um what appears to be like a little restaurant for um for people to have a nice meal out as well and so it's um right next to the the amphitheater where gladiatorial games and and theater was held and so she has a a, a really nice entertainment space that she runs by herself um and the reason we know about it is that just as vesuvius erupted she had put up a for rent sign outside um and was offering it so that somebody else could run it and she could go off and do um some other business uh, for at least 5 years um and she described what she was putting up for rent in that in that advert um and it's a real insight into one the kind of entertainment and and nights out and and um and things people could do in their leisure time, but also that a woman was running this all by herself. There's a wall painting, 25 meters long. Is it 25, yeah, 25 meters huge. long? And what what does it show? It shows Pompeii um on the in the forum on market day and is a kind of very realistic, naturalistic depiction of people. Um, and the things that they would do in the forum. So it has children being taught. It has people buying shoes. It has people selling things like tools and fabrics. Um, it has, my favorite bit is that it shows a, a, a man with a dog on a string and a woman is giving him money. So he's interpreted as a beggar um, with a dog on a string being given charity and it shows the kind of middle classes of Pompeii and what they would do in their daily business um, and how they they would just go around and, and do their daily shopping and uh, read the notices in the forum and uh, educate their children. And it's lovely. And this whole establishment was a six entertainment center for people of means who were not going to ever be super rich. This was, yeah. a, you emphasize, this was a moment where they could live like the rich for one night. Yeah, so you can go to this, you can be in a nice bath that are not the giant public baths with thousands of people in them. You can be in one that only has 10 or 12 people and, and which are beautifully um, put together. You can be in a space which is quiet, which is a garden with running water and fish and um, is not full of other people playing games. And you can have a reclined dinner, um, which is something that only the rich do. It's a Reclining at dinner is a sign of real luxury because it means you have people to serve that to you. Um, and so you can have a night out in the same way that you might go to like a very nice restaurant in your town or you might go out for a, a, a special night on your anniversary, they could go out and have a special night that um, experience luxury for a single night um, when they can't have it every day at home. She had a private apartment in the back that was quite luxurious as well. And it may be that she died with Vesuvius because they found a skeleton across the garden uh, with gold rings and gold necklaces. Is it your opinion yeah. that's likely her? 
I think it probably is likely her. Um, I think it's more likely to be her than anybody else. That it's a it's a rich woman that died. She has a lot of jewelry on her, um, and she's not facing to be running away. She's facing towards the um, towards the sanctuary that was at the back, the sanctuary of Isis. Um, and so I think that um, I think it's probably that she died um, in in Vesuvius with her with her building. From 79 CE, we go to the other edge of the empire. This is just south of Hadrian's Wall, if you visited Hadrian's Wall in the north, not far from where Scotland begins. And this is a Roman fort, Vindolanda, who, that was found just in, here in the late 20th century. And they're still excavating it. They're still finding things. A Roman fort at the edge, because after Cartamandua traveled to Rome, the Romans had to worry about the Brigantes rising again. So they built a string of forts before Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall is 122 CE. This is about 95. This fort was built in 85 CE following Emma's very careful reporting. And somewhere between 95 and 110, somewhere in there, the Trajan emperor now, because Domitian, who is not successful as the last of the Flavians, wanders off. He's probably assassinated. He was assassinated. Yes. <laughs> in his uh, own bedroom, he was assassinated. He comes to a violent end. And Nerva, who probably was responsible for the assassination, then relieves the whole empire. And then Trajan comes in and is a good emperor. And the forts were meant to establish the limits of the frontier. And two women living in forts separated by a number of miles correspond with each other. And the discovery is of the cards riding back and forth to them. Also, a lot of business with the fort. The important people are Silposia Lepidina writing to her friend Claudia Severa. And what do these letters tell us about them, Emma? The first one that was found um, was a birthday party invitation um, written inviting Silposia Lepidina uh, to a party at a... At nearby fort we don't know where the the nearby fort was briga it's called but um it's not yet been found uh but it's a birthday party invitation and the invitation shows us that one there are these two women who are highly educated um writing to one another that they're having parties in these forts on the far edge of the roman empire um that they have a social scene that's occurring amongst um women of equestrian rank um, and they also mention their children. Um, so we know that there are full families that live there um, alongside the soldiers. Um, and the letters go backwards and forwards with them visiting one another for um, various celebrations. So for New Year, they see each other. They, they hold religious festivals together. Um, and the, their husbands write to each other as well and buy each other presents. Um, and they reveal a real um, a, a space where it, it's not just men being men, which is Spartan and hard and, and entirely military and completely cut off from the rest of Rome, but is a space where families live, um, where women live and where they have a social life um, that is more than just kind of grim fort as you might imagine them yes the fort has uh an ability to rebuild itself every time there's a new deployment and this is cohor bacta uh batarorum which means these are not from italy these are not romans by this time in the roman empire at the end of the first century the romans have remember they're very good at making you work for yourself and paying <laughs> The Batavians have been trouble. These are Batavian soldiers, uh, auxiliaries for the Roman army, led by a Batavian commander who is Lepidina's husband. His name is Serralis. And back home where they came from, uh, the Batavians are obedient because their sons and brothers and, and heirs are off guarding Britain, taking it very seriously. What I liked especially about this is the Roman army didn't allow you to marry, but the the fort is filled with women and families. And so clearly marriage was a legal term. These are all yeah. men 
the troopers, the centurions, and the officers must all have their wives with them. They all have their wives with them. They have their children there. Um, a lot of people uh, bring wives with them um, that live in the in the fort with them. Um, what we have is lots and lots of shoes from Vindolanda in particular. Um, and there's hundreds of women's shoes, um, very nice women's shoes, uh, children's shoes all over the fort that show that it's not just the commanders that bring wives with them and that have women living with them in long term relationships with children, but also the kind of average rank and file soldiers also have uh, women in their quarters that live there um, and that work and, alongside them. It's not a space of... Um, that has no domesticity. Also, lots of lists. I love the Romans. <laughs> they love a list. They love a list. They love paperwork. Uh, roast wild swan. Have you ever? Do you have such a thing today in the twenty first century? It's illegal now to eat a swan. The king owns all the swans. <laughs> it sounds very medieval, but you're not allowed to eat swans anymore. <laughs> well, they had meals that were not. I mean, to call them lavish is an understatement. And, yeah. and, and you you make a list of what they drank at one meal. Yeah, all of the beer, the 300 gallons of beer that they have at one point and, and crates and crates of wine um, that they have for a festival. And wild boar is very popular. Um, and yeah, they have um, extremely nice food and they there's lists of the uh, furniture and the... Um, accessories that Lepidina brought with her when she had to decorate the fort that has, you know, curtains and bronze lamps and special uh, white blankets, which is very expensive and uh, lots of bronze and silver. Um, and they're living a nice life there. The book is A Rome of One's Own, The Forgotten Women of the Roman Empire. Emma Southern is the author. We now go, remember, Augustus had one weakness. It was his daughter. Well, the Roman Empire has one weakness, and it's Christianity. And we're about to go to a saint, a saint who lives uh, between the end of the 2nd century AD and the beginning of the 3rd century AD in Carthage, the destroyed city rebuilt. Uh, her name is Perpetua, and we find her at 23, condemned as a Christian. Emma, at this point, Pliny the Younger is commanding for the Roman Empire, the governor of Carthage. He writes Rome. He writes his emperor saying, what am I to do? Why was he, <laughs> why was he flummoxed? And how was, at this point, what was the policy of the empire towards young women who said they were Christians? Uh, so, yeah, Pliny's letter to Trajan, um, which was written just slightly before this, um, but it, uh, about... Uh, 112 is his his, um, his letter was written is from Bithynia um, and he is baffled because technically it's not illegal to be a Christian but it is illegal to not worship the gods um, and so he doesn't when people come to him and say these people are Christians um, he he isn't entirely sure whether to punish them or or not. Um, and eventually he decides that if they refuse to worship the Roman gods, then he will have to execute them as heretics, essentially, um, and as traitors to the Romans, because the worship of the Roman gods is fundamental to their understanding of citizenship and keeping the empire safe. And refusing to keep the empire safe is, is treason. Um, and so... He sets out what becomes the policy, which is that if a Christian insists on saying they're a Christian and won't sacrifice to the emperor or to the the polytheistic gods, then they will be executed as traitors. Um, but otherwise, they will be that, left off. That's the policy of the second century then. So as yeah. Perpetua was born into this. Now, she's well born. She's educated. Yeah. Her father is prosperous. And at 23, she's pregnant. She's, in fact, she's just about to give birth. There's no mention of her husband. Did you miss that part? No, there is no mention of her husband in her own diary. She has just had her child um, when she is arrested. Um, and But the only person that she talks about in her diary that she wrote um, is, her, um, is her father and her son. This is 
She's born probably 180, right at the end of... Yeah, somewhere around, yeah. Somewhere around Marcus Aurelius's time. And then Commodus, we know him well, gladiator, uh, a rascal. But the empire is organized so that it can be sustained. Not everything has to be from the center. But the policy has been set out that you need to renounce your Christianity, if only for like an afternoon, right? You don't... Yeah. (laughs) Church next Sunday. You can, although that causes problems later. But technically, you can um, go and uh, renounce it, and then you can go, go back to church on Sunday or the next day, um, and and uh, and be okay again. But um, Perpetua and many other people refused to do this and um, felt that that would be a betrayal, and they would uh, prefer to die in the name of their faith. We need to introduce Tertullian just because his name comes up when you know about Perpetua today. Who was he? Tertullian is a, a bishop in Carthage who is a, a writer um, and a theologian. He writes a lot about um, developing the theology of Mary in particular, um, and of um, he's very interested in women uh, and and how much he intensely dislikes them. Um, but and he writes about martyrs in his own time, including Perpetua, um, and and develops a theology that martyrs are the greatest athletes of God. Uh, they are gladiators for God. And Perpetua believes it, and so does her young friend Felicity, who is. A- Yes. An enslaved person, and they die together. The five members of this small church die in one day to the entertainment of the crowd. However, there's a detail here that Emma works very carefully into the story. The Romans believe, remember, that the honorable way to die is poison, to destroy yourself. That is the end of your life, and it you you can avoid dishonor. The Christians, on the other hand, do not believe in poison. They believe that the suffering can be what replaced the suffering is the road to heaven. You're fighting the yeah, devil road to heaven. Yeah. It is a, a, a that, that suffering is redemptive and humiliation because of the, um, the crucifixion and the torture of Jesus Christ. They believe that suffering um, is in a, uh, uh, an emulation of, of what Jesus did for humanity. And so um, suffering and humiliation becomes a pathway to salvation um and the what they experience um when they're thrown to the beasts uh perpetua is thrown to a cow uh is is an emulation uh, and is inherently is holy uh suffering it with um with bravery is is a holy and redemptive activity the romans believe that the torture would intimidate you into doing the right thing and yeah. that only the very brave and honorable manage to poison themselves. Otherwise you'll be tortured and kicked around and stabbed and you'll die horribly. So obey us. The Christians, however, regarded that as not a challenge, not a threat, and were ready to suffer it. And Perpetua and Felicity, uh, they don't die because of the cow that uh, attacks them. They have their throats cut. But I mentioned the Christianity entering in the end of the first end of the second, beginning of the third, because we'll just have a moment here uh, uh, to mention that the book ends with the Romans acknowledging that Christianity is the dominant spirituality of the empire. That's when this story ends, and the second part of Rome, the one we're living with today, begins again. The book is A Rome of One's Own, The Forgotten Women of the Roman Empire. Emma Southern is the author, Highly recommended. Great fun. I'm John Batchelor.